Welcome to the first episode of Deer Dirt. This is a new series that I'm going to be producing for Hunt Stand. And uh, I'm on the farm today. It's a beautiful early summer morning. And I want to talk about how to evaluate potential hunting areas. And there's, there's three levels that we're going to dive into here. The first is if you're looking at purchasing a piece of land. Uh, what are the questions that you need to answer to feel good about you know, the future potential of that property. Uh, if you're looking for permission areas, uh, you're a little bit more limited there because um, you know, you're kind of stuck within, let's say, a certain circle. But we'll talk about that too. But then let's also talk about public land. And there your, your uh, opportunities are more open because any public land obviously is available to you. So you have to figure out which ones are worth the effort. So let's start with uh, permission properties and really the hardest part about permission properties is the network uh, you've got to do the networking because the good old days of just going around and knocking on doors and uh, getting permission to hunt it's those days are coming to a, a pretty fast halt and maybe in the Great Plains states that's still potential some parts of the Midwest, there's still some hope, but a lot of the more populated areas of the country, uh, the uh, landowners get hit way too often and that door is shut very tight. So you have to go through your, your list of, of contacts, your friends, friends of friends, your relatives, friends of relatives. You got to find some little crack where you can start with your foot in the door. And uh, obviously, having a resource like hunt stand where you've got all the property lines uh, laid out on private property is really helpful because then once you do identify and say well i know so and so from work um, i know they've got some land let me take a look quick and see what that what that property you know what it what it's comprised of maybe i don't even want to mess with it you know it's no good to go to all the trouble to get permission and find out that they've got a five acre lot uh, I mean, maybe you can get hunting there, but um, you know, for the effort, really focus on those areas that have potential. So anyway, um, go through the list. Boy, I'd write them down. Write down the names of anybody that you can think of that you know or friends of friends that might have uh, property that you could hunt. And then go through the, the hunt stand, uh, private landowner layer, and identify what that property looks like. Because you're going to be able to see the topographic lines on there. You're going to see the aerial photos. You're going to have a real good feel for, you know, not only where, you know, situated, you know, with respect to you, like how far away is it, but also the kind of neighborhood that it's in. I mean, how much, like, deer hunting looking country is around there. How huntable is the property? Uh, at least have, you know, some uh, basis when you approach them of feeling like this is worth you know going the extra you know the extra mile because at the end of the day it's probably not going to come down to you knocking on their door saying hey i'm you know your cousin bob's buddy uh, and they're going to go oh yeah come on it's still going to come down to you doing something usually and i've gotten permission on a lot of properties by bailing hay building fence helping out with projects so you just want to make sure that what you're getting into is, is going to be worth the effort. Because if you go down that road, you will find places to hunt. Because people are always looking for somebody to help. Um, you just want to make sure that the, the effort that you put in is worth it in the end. So um, short of, of really maybe diving deep into what comprises a great deer neighborhood, um, I mean, obviously, if you're buying land, that's more important because you're putting out a lot of cash. But if you're expending sweat equity, it's important too. So let's go into it just a little bit. Um, there obviously there has to be deer in the area. So you know, driving around, you should be able to satisfy that. You should be able to see you know trails crossing the roads or maybe deer out in fields in the evenings. Um, beyond that, the structure of the property is important. Uh, you want to see some terrain, ideally. You know, so you've got some things that you can identify as uh, influencing how deer move. Uh, you know, so, so it's flat. I mean, you can't say no, but it'd be nice if it had some terrain features. Um, you want to look at 
the percentage of ag around you. Like how well does this property hold deer? Are they gonna be leaving here at a certain time and going someplace else where there's more food? Uh, the amount and type of cover is important. And again, you can get all of this uh, from studying the layers on the hunt stand app. Uh, this is all available to you. And there's some more sophisticated layers too that come with the Pro Whitetail uh, subscription that, that gives you, you know, month by month um, mapping of the area so you can see what crop rotations have been in the past. You can learn a lot about a property by being able to go back, you know, several months over the history of it. So uh, that's that's important. Uh, that's my starting point. I'd say if you're if you're looking for permission property. Um, now let's look at um, the uh, public land opportunities and you know obviously you got to know where the public land is in the first place so once again there's layers on hunt stand for that there are public land layers and uh, you can identify exactly how big the properties are again how they're uh, structured the amount of habitat the amount of terrain uh, the accessibility like where are the parking spots how hard are certain parts of this uh, property to get to. So those are all super important. Uh, for sure, without a doubt, the number one starting point for any public land hunting is the app. You need to get the map in your hand and study it for a long time before you decide how you're going to approach a certain piece of, of public land. Um, and then one step further, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more, but one step further, you want to have multiple spots. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because you may find that once you do all the work and get back in there, there's somebody else already hunting the spot. Um, so you need to have options. You don't want to put, uh, say, your whole season on the line with just one area that you've scouted and studied. So I think you need a minimum of three to four very likely areas. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now, uh, I kind of mentioned it already, but the key in most cases, uh, you know, I've, I've hunted public land some, but I know a lot of people who have been very successful at it. And the uh, inaccessibility of the spot is super important to the success that you're gonna have. You know, some people are gonna hunt a very short distance from the road. Some people are gonna go in a little bit further. Not too many people are gonna go way back in, especially if it involves, you know, uh, uh, extra logistics like a kayak or you know, putting a small boat into a slough and paddling, you know, back to an island or something like that. Uh, that really uh, eliminates a lot of the field. So those are the kind of spots you want to find. You know, the deer are going to be moving more naturally in those areas. When deer feel hunting pressure, they don't just necessarily leave. You know, in, in fact, they usually don't. A lot of studies have suggested that they're still there. They just find pockets to hide and they only move at night. So the more naturally the deer are moving, the more you know, your odds increase, especially with a bow. You need natural movement to be successful as a bow hunter. So that means you need to be hunting deer that aren't feeling a lot of hunting pressure. Um, so either you gotta find the little overlooked pockets, like a little small 40 acre piece of, pu of public land back behind you know, Walmart or something like that, you know, where people just don't even know it's there. Or you've gotta find the big spots and you've gotta get well off the road and well away from any of the access points. And, you know, obviously how you hunt the property, that's gonna be dictated to a greater or lesser extent by what you find there, but you can learn a lot of that from the uh, app too. But that's beyond the scope of this episode. We're gonna come back to, to uh, some of those topics in the future. Now, uh, this brings us back around to the final one, which is deciding what to buy. And uh, I've bought a lot of hunting land over the years and you know, I haven't made too many mistakes yet. Um, I, I'm trying to think if I've really made any. Um, probably, you know, somewhere along the way. But the key to it, and, and I got this tip from a, a really well-known uh, outdoor personality. He said, don't buy something that you may consider reselling in the future if you're not willing to keep it forever. So you may look at it and say, well, this little 40 that I'm going to buy is just a stepping stone. But if it's not one that you're willing to keep forever, there's something wrong with it. And you're gonna have a harder time selling it too. So every piece that you look at to purchase, you look at it from the standpoint of, of would I be satisfied keeping this forever? And 
that's going to separate a lot of, of the wheat from the chaff because there are certain features of, of hunting land that that uh, you know keep it or disqualify it um, you know on the list so I mean the number one thing is the neighborhood you know what's going on around you uh, that's so important and it's the hardest thing to figure out because the realtor is not going to tell you that you know he may not even know um, and if he does know he's probably going to play dumb uh, unless it's an awesome neighborhood then of course it's going to be splashed all over the the uh, listing uh, I'm, I'm not I'm trying not to be cynical but that's just the way that business works you just have to keep your eyes open you have to do your own research on that you have to know what your neighbors are doing uh, potential neighbors you know what type of deer are they killing how many deer are they killing and it's super hard information to gain especially if you have to make a quick decision that's where all the risk is at uh, because it's easy to evaluate the property itself i mean you can walk around on it and you can see you know the potential for food plots here you know we can do these management practices um, you know the only thing i'm really c careful about now that people might not think is obvious are the invasive uh, species there's a lot of invasive species in the timber and they can be super hard to get rid of so you need to know what those are too but again those are all things that it's pretty straightforward once you're walking the property the hardest one is how good is the neighborhood and that's why you'll see on the listing so many photos trail cam photos and what they're trying to tell you is hey it's a great neighborhood look at all these big deer um, so if you're not seeing trail cam photos recent trail cam photos that should be a red flag um, even if you are you kind of want to verify it because I hate to sound even more cynical but you know I've heard stories of the photos being shot someplace else and, and pictured with you know a certain farm um, so you kind of want to say yeah this is awesome show me that camera site um, you know it's kind of harsh but you're spending a lot of money you know you got to get this right so anyway uh, buying hunting land um, the whole key is the neighborhood and obviously if you're trying to get permission to hunt I mean it'd be awesome to be in a great neighborhood too you just don't have that kind of leverage you just go through the list of, of people that you know and the options that you've got and it's gonna be a pretty short list you know when it comes down to it so you don't get to say well I'm gonna be in such and such neighborhood and I'm gonna wait till a piece of land comes up for sale there or comes up for permission there <laughs> that doesn't happen <laughs> so uh, anyway do not be too hasty um, buying land I guess that's the takeaway you know you're you know I had another buddy that told me one time he never lost money on something that he didn't buy and uh, you know I get that there's opportunity cost I mean you can miss a chance at something and wish forever for the rest of your life that you know why didn't I just buy that I've got 20 of those stories to tell but uh, that's uh, I guess those are my best words of advice you know the the buying land again um, you can take advantage of all of these uh, hunt stand resources. You pull up the app, there's all kinds of layers in there of information, crop history again. You can see all the topo maps. You can see the 3D relief maps. You want to know everything that you possibly can about an area. And again, like I said, it's all about the neighborhood. Once you walk the property itself, that becomes more self-explanatory. Um, there aren't as many questions about that specific property, but you've got to do all of that backgrounding. Um, to figure out whether the area where this property sits is a good one. Well, I appreciate you joining me. And uh, I think the next episode, we're gonna talk about really this next next level of this. Like, let's say you did buy something. Um, how can you assess where the upside is? And, or better yet, you're looking at this piece of property and potentially to buy it. How can you assess where you are on that property versus where you can be so like how good can it get um, that's a challenge because you know like this farm I mean I'm going to use this farm as an example on the next episode because um, it's a beautiful farm obviously but the uh, it wasn't that great of a deer hunting farm and uh, I'm still working on that part so why did I buy it you know what what crossed my mind that made me think that I could convert this, let's say average, or maybe even below average uh, Iowa property into a top producer. But I appreciate you joining us this week, and uh, we'll see you right back here again for the next episode of Deer Dirt.